Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to a continuing series of author events virtually presented on Zoom. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book that we're presenting this evening, Karis Books and More is our book selling partner. They're located here in Decatur, Georgia. And if you'd like to do that, a link has been provided for you in the chat section of your screen. There are also our partners for our event tomorrow night, Stacey Abrams for her book, While Justice Sleeps. It's being presented with the Decatur Book Festival as part of the Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series. You can purchase a ticket for that event also um, with the link that has been provided in the chat section. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank UGA Press. They've been our partner for so many events over the years and they continue to publish very thoughtful and very beautiful books. We are so very pleased to once again partner with them to present you this event this evening. Right now, I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that if you would like to ask a question after the formal presentation part of this evening's event takes place, go ahead and type your question in the Q&A section, which you can find either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Also, if you would like live transcription for the hearing impaired, that can be enabled by pressing the CC button that you can find at the top or the bottom of your screen. Right now, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our guest this evening. Our feature author is Akira Drake Rodriguez, who writes about race, cities, and space in the United States. She is currently an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design and was recently awarded a grant from the Spencer Foundation to study critical participatory planning strategies in school facilities planning in Philadelphia. She received her PhD from the Edwin J. Blaustein School of Urban Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. And she has a master's in public administration from the Fells Institute of the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's of science in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Our moderator for this evening is Stephanie Stokes, who is a public radio journalist in Atlanta, Georgia. Her work is featured locally on WABE 90.1 and nationally on NPR and Marketplace. She also contributes to the Bitter Settler. Joining her is guest panelist Nedra Deadweiler, who founded Civil Bikes in an effort to make Atlanta's people more visible. Civil Bikes highlights history, art, and culture presented in the Atlanta landscape. Currently, she is the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Civic Center, the Center for Civic Innovation, and is currently a Beltline Scholar, where her research focuses on developing a practice of historic preservation as a form of activism, education, and community building. She's joined this evening by guest panelist King Williams. King is a multimedia documentary film director and author based in Atlanta, Georgia. A former intern turned assistant of film director Spike Lee, Williams has now focused his attention on his upcoming directorial debut, The Atlanta Way, a documentary on gentrification this fall. Williams has given lectures at several universities, including Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, Georgia Tech, University of Alabama School of Journalism, and Emory University. Williams has also given lectures for, Tech for Teach for America, C5 Georgia Youth Foundation, Atlanta Beltline, and for the TEDx brand. Williams is also the co-host of the Neighborhood Watch podcast, a podcast on gentrification, urbanism, and culture with Dr. Renee Skeet, of the CDC. Right now, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator this evening to get things started for you all. Stephanie? Hmm, thank you. I'm really excited to talk about this book, like really, really, really excited. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I think, thankfully, actually, Akira um, has a presentation to start us off to give us an overview of all the really fascinating research that she's done. So I will then pass it off to you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, um, everyone, King and Nedra. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you later. Um, Georgia Center for the Book, um, Karis Books, uh, UGA Press, the City of Atlanta, everyone who's here, <laughs> anyone in the future watching the recording, I'm very excited, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm just going to do um, a really quick presentation um, to give an overview of the book. 
Um, and then we'll hop right into um, a discussion from there. Um, so thank you again. My name is Akira Drake Rodriguez. I'm assistant professor of city planning at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm really excited to present this research um, now in book form, <laughs> uh, Diverging Space for Deviance, the Politics of Atlanta's Public Housing. Um, so first I'd like to just start and talk about the title um, and this picture and sort of what um, the idea of deviance and divergence actually means in this text. Um, this is really meant to um, <clears throat> think about the politics of public housing as one that creates these categories um, of who's allowed in and who um, is allowed to move out, um, and thinking about deviance as people who have generally been excluded from these programs. And so I look at um, Atlanta's history from about um, the early 1930s into the mid 2010s to look at the history of um, public housing, the history of planning, and the history of politics in the city of Atlanta. And I do this by kind of tracing these different categories of deviance um, during these different periods of um, public housing planning and construction in the city. Um, so the book is about six chapters long, and I look at three different public housing developments in the city, uh, University Homes, which is the first uh, public housing opened for African American in the city in 1937. I look at Grady Homes, which opened in 1940, and I look at Perry Homes, which opened in 1955. Um, all of these public housing developments were in different areas of the city, um, and they also hosted different populations um, and therefore excluded different forms of deviance. But what I like to look at um, over the course of the history of public housing is how actually deviants were allowed to come in and space was made for them. And so public housing served as this sort of alternative political space for people who traditionally did not get political attention. And so when I start off the book with university homes in the 1930s and the New Deal, Black people at that point are not legally enfranchised fully in the state of Georgia because of the white democratic primary that lasted until about 1946. Um, when I look at public housing in um, Perry Homes, for example, in the 1950s, uh, much of the uh, trials and tribulations are around single women and single mothers in particular who were being forced into public housing without any sort of community structure or organization and really had to create a politics and a voice for themselves through public housing. And then finally, I look at Grady Homes and looking at it in the 1960s, during a time of economic opportunity in the city of Atlanta, um, specifically for those who were marginalized and disenfranchised. And so I look at the role of Maynard Jackson and the neighborhood planning unit as a way of creating spaces and opportunities for those who are being excluded. The last two chapters look at sort of um, the beginning of the end of public housing. Um, I look at the 1980s. I cover, of course, the, the role of the Atlanta child murders. Uh, nearly a third of the victims uh, lived or were found near public housing developments. And so I look at the critical role um, of public housing and that, it, that time in Atlanta and constructing a new form of deviant um, and look at how that sort of created a downfall for public housing actually um, that was only sort of facilitated by uh, the arrival of the Olympics and the eventual demolition of public housing in the city. Uh, so the book covers, again, roughly 75 years, looking at three different developments and sort of the organizing um, from tenants and those who surrounded the public housing developments in order to create uh, these sort of divergent spaces for deviants. And so when I um, kind of start again with the book, um, one of the uh, first things that I start with is, of course, as a planner, uh, there's a lot of planning maps and zoning maps in here. Um, and so one of the things I look at is, you know, planning kind of tells you what um, 
land makers and city makers consider to be of highest and best use? What are their priorities? Um, and so here is the first sort of um, set of zoning maps in 1922, introduced by Robert Witten, who was sort of going around the US to create these different zones and categories in city in which we could organize land uses. And so uh, the uses of the zone, whether it's residential or commercial, um, that's determined um, what area area um, could be in, what height the buildings could be, but also includes this idea of a racial component. Um, and again, thinking about highest and best use with uh, use that's typically residential, single family homes, um, and that would be U1. Um, here you see there's also race districts. And so right away you see that race, particularly R2, which is colored, you have to assume that the default R1 is not colored um, or white. And we see here that that indicates that in this zoning map, the highest and best use were actually white single family home residential neighborhoods in the city. And so even at the very beginning, deviance is constructed as a racial component as well as how we're actually using the land. Um, I then take us through um, the Great Depression and the New Deal and the arrival of public housing in the United States, which came in 1937 officially, but started a little earlier in the city of Atlanta, which actually had the first public housing in the nation um, and is actually sort of the reason I selected the city of Atlanta for this project. Um, it managed to have both the, the first public housing in the nation and was one of the first cities to tear uh, the majority of its public housing down. Um, at its peak, um, you know, in the sort of 40 years of constructing public housing in the city, uh, there are roughly 15,000 units housing 50,000 people or nearly 10% of the population at its height in the 1980s. And so it was a very strong political force. Um, so I take us through uh, bringing in the New Deal, which actually did bring in some political opportunity, as I said, for um, African Americans at the time. On the left is um, sort of the product of this New Deal, uh, which was the production of Black public housing developments and a new professional class, <clears throat> Black housing managers and social workers who were trained at the Atlanta School of Social Work, uh, producing uh, tons of professionals that would go in, provide housing, provide uh, professionalization and political education in order to create new routes of socioeconomic mobility, uh, which is really critical, again, at the time when the majority of Black Atlantans could not vote at the time that University Homes was constructed. Um, they were only kind of eligible to vote in general or special elections where their political power was significantly weakened. Uh, this allowed them to provide uh, public housing exclusively for African Americans in the New Deal. Uh, black and white public housing residents were allocated with the same number of developments. There were some differences. Black neighborhoods were generally the land is cheaper and the household incomes are going to be lower. So you'll see on the left, um, the John Hope Homes, which is uh, one of the first public housing developments for African Americans in Atlanta. And then on the right, Clark Howell Homes, one of the first for white families having different uh, maximum and minimum yearly incomes. And so public housing, of course, in the early 1930s was uh, not the place of last resort, but instead was actually um, a very difficult uh, uh, development to get into, a very difficult program to get into, um, and excluded, of course, the very slum housing that it was looking to take out. Here we see the actual role of land in creating new uh, political opportunities in that we see the Great Migration's impact in the city of Atlanta, <clears throat> which was already um, a growing Black city in the 1930s and 40s. Um, here we see uh, two maps, the 1940 and 1950 census, with the darker areas suggesting a greater proportion of the Black population. Um, this threat of the Black population and Black voting after the end of the primary 
meant that the plan of improvement of 1951 expanded the city of Atlanta to accommodate a new um, virtually all black ghetto in the Northwest. And so I cover this experience, this period of great public housing development expansion and growth in the 1970s that also created a significant political uh, bulwark for the city there. At the time of urban renewal um, in the 1950s, we see a new militarized public housing tenant, um, one that is sort of protesting against management, which is no longer providing the socioeconomic mobility that it once did in public housing. Uh, public housing is underfunded, it is undermaintained, um, it is full of ra uh, rats and pests. Um, and so women, predominantly single Black women, start to go on rent strikes. They start to exercise a political power that was not uh, really afforded to them. Here we see on the right Ethel May Matthews, um, who is organizing with Emma's House, um, as well as on the left, Mary Sanford of Perry Homes. Uh, these are two women who fought inside and out of public housing's official tenant associations as a way of expanding greater social welfare and greater programming for those who were excluded. Uh, Mary Sanford worked with her tenant association and the NAACP to provide um, tons of organizing mobilizations to get this spur line going um, to Bankhead, um, not all the way to where Perry Holmes was, but it certainly addressed a core issue for this Black women workforce that was traveling by bus to the Blue Line, connecting down to the city center, and then coming all the way north to go work in the northern suburbs of Buckhead. And so uh, although this was a nearly 20 year battle, it did certainly come um, directly from the experiences of these tenants um, and their, their uh, peers that surrounded them. Here we have Susie Laborde, who is a matriarch in Grady Homes, really pushing out the economic opportunity program um, in the city of Atlanta, particularly the East Central location. Here, she created a drug rehabilitation center, farmer's markets, daycares, and several other uh, spaces and places for a largely ignored population, um, the sort of disenfranchised and demobilized population in public housing during the 60s and 70s, who were faced with little socioeconomic economic mobility as jobs continued to flee north to the suburbs. By the 1980s, public housing is getting a negative um, connotation at the national level. Stephanie and I were talking about the myth of Pruitt-Igo, which was uh, demolished in 1972 very publicly in St. Louis. Um, and so now public housing has this image as human file cabinets that are set to explode. Um, in that sort of national uh, narrative at the local level, of course, the Atlanta child murderers putting plenty of attention on public housing and plenty of attention on mothers. Um, and so the idea that you have these dueling sort of responses, the bat patrol that was very visible and masculine and performative and stop, which was about mobilizing, organizing, finding safe spaces for children and actually reclaiming um, the Atlanta child murderers as sort of these children who required care um, and not suspicion. In the 1990s, the arrival of the Olympics and the announcement of Atlanta as the host is the official beginning of the end for public housing. In the 1980s, the city was already looking to sell the land underneath public housing um, and use it to expand the convention center, the downtown connector, and other things that were making money in the city. Uh, public housing was seen as non-functional. At that point, many of the buildings were 50, if not 60 years years old, um, and it seemed like common sense to find a new way to deal with concentrated poverty in the city. Um, this is actually Ethel May Matthews again. She's in, she was fighting the whole time. <laughs> um, and so, and this is Columbus Ward, who is still very active here in the city. Um, here we have the program Hope Six, uh, which actually got a lot of support here in the city, um, both from former executive director of the Atlanta Housing Authority, Renee Glover, um, but also from local mayors, Mayor Jackson, as well as um, we have a lot of sort of national um, 
uh, people who are very much in support of the program. Um, but HOPE 6 was very much piloted here in the city of Atlanta um, and showed that uh, public housing could be done in a new way, uh, which meant lots of sort of public subsidy and private development and um, kind of getting public housing off of the books. Um, and so part of HOPE 6 allowed um, the state to sort of get rid of the cost of public housing and the burden of that cost by privatizing and redeveloping it under new private ownership or management. Um, and so this is sort of the end of my presentation, which is where the book actually started when I saw this article in the New York Times um, talking about the demolition of um, Bowen homes here, um, thinking about um, this new way in this Atlanta way, which I'm excited to hear King talk about as well, um, and thinking about um, how does this sort of demolition really impact um, not only sort of the housing market of the city, we could talk a lot about that, but also just thinking about the politics of the city. Um, public housing served as a political space for certainly working class, but even sort of deviant interest in the city. And so moving forward, thinking about uh, with this loss of public housing, what, what are the spaces and, and who um, are the organizations that we can look to to replicate some of the benefits that public housing provided during its history? So I will stop sharing there. And open it up for our discussion. Wow. Those are great questions. I feel like we should just start with them. <laughs> uh, wow, what an incredible overview. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that your, your book looks at how public housing can include these types of, these people who have historically been marginalized in the city. Um, because at the same time, your, your book documents over and over again how public housing development excluded those people as well. And I was thinking even in the beginning with um, University Homes, the first development for Black residents in Atlanta, um, that that um, replaced a, uh, I guess it's a slum, the Beaver Slide community. And you mm -hmm. say that they were not included in the planning process at all. So yeah. um, I'm curious about that tension. How did um, the residents sort of overcome these active efforts to actually exclude them from these developments or the, the planning and future of these developments? Um, it's really a back and forth. Um, I think that what tenant associations and public housing developments do is sort of like break open that space um, where the, the thing with public housing is that there's so many scales to it, right? It's a federally like legislated, state authorized, locally administered program. And so there's like all of these different like connections that you have. You have your housing manager, you have the executive director, you have the board, you have regional HUD, you have direct HUD. And so that, that first picture I showed of those, um, that manager staff at University Homes, um, in the 1930s, they were talking directly to Robert Weaver, who was like the head of the, the kitchen cabinet, the Black kitchen cabinet um, for, you know, President Roosevelt. And so they were in constant conversation with, you know, national officials. And when Susie Laborde wanted to start um, the um, economic opportunity in East Central Atlanta, she wrote like directly to the president, right? Like she was just not, you know, Eva Davis has like this amazing uh, relationship with Jimmy Carter. And so there's just like a lot of public housing tenants that were able to just like hop these scales, like can't get respect from their landlord, right? But they can get it from the president. Um, immediately. And so there was just really something um, liberating, um, again, like when you're in, and, and we know this, right, like when you're in a blue city in a red state, or like vice versa, like you need to be able to kind of jump those scales in order to, to get that change affected. And so, although like in public housing, you know, yeah, you have a limited number of units, if people can't move out, you can't let everyone in, right? Um, and some people don't want to stay in public housing, right? It doesn't work for everyone. And so, but there should be some, some sort of uh, space, some sort of association that allows you to have that sort of capacity, responsiveness, another way of politically participating. And so 
certainly, um, you know, as they were constructing university homes, they, they said in the planning meeting, they were like, only like 2% of Black Atlantans can afford this. There's no way that this is going to work. And they were right. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of vacancies for the four and five bedrooms because no one with that size family could afford the $50 a week rent. Um, so that was like this $50 a month, but <laughs> it was very much like a, a, a difficult um, rock and hard place that comes with these sort of programs. I think the other thing that connects to that your book brings up a lot is the paternalism of these, this program, this idea that public housing residents don't know what will improve their lives and they need to be told that. And I'm curious what King and Natra think about that, because that makes me think a lot about today and just developments today and programs for the poor. I'm, I'm curious, um, King, for example, you know, you've done a lot of work looking at the history of Atlanta. Did that resonate with you, this um, idea that Atlanta is telling its poorer population um, what, what is good for them? Uh, it definitely resonated with me because one, I got to see it firsthand. Um, one is a student at Georgia State University and even prior to that, just dealing with a lot of people um, through my parents and just being around Atlanta. But more importantly, uh, it's, I'm gonna say this now, I gotta say, this is my favorite book of the year so far. And so, <laughs> It is, it is. Um, but the paternalism to what Stephanie is saying, I saw this a lot, especially in the last days of like that era of public housing around 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, with how they treated Bowen homes and Bankhead courts and how the residents didn't know what was good for them. And it was interesting reading that from different generations past, so. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the issues are the same. Sidewalks, traffic, parking, um, places to play for youth, juvenile delinquency, um, police from the 1940s, letters like, if you're going to have traffic cops, can we have some black traffic cops because they know how to talk to our children. And it's heartbreaking to know that those letters could easily be written today. Yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in and not echo King. Like, this is definitely one of my favorite books, too, because it, it just reframed how I see Atlanta's history in terms of because it leaves out, it leaves out working people, it leaves out poor people for the most part. Like, you gave visibility to a, a, a large population of Atlantans that who completely get missed over and it gets reframed through the perspective of the black elite, right? Like yeah. we have neighborhood house. I know they were on the front lines fighting and Gracetown Hamilton, like doing the real hard work. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, there were also people like I had to write the names down so I don't forget, Miss Laborde, Eva yeah. May, you know, Eva Davis, like all these women who were doing some good work and they were speaking from their experience. And, um, but I will also say like, there's something about the way people talk about their own lives. Like my father, when he was a young, well, really he lived in public housing as a child and through high, you know, high school, mm -hmm. and that's not how he saw himself. That is not how he talks about his own history. Right. So like, no, we didn't live in public housing. That's not how he saw his home. It was, it was his community. It, there were people that he associated with. And so, I mean, I, I just, I will say, yes, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, but that paternalism is a theme um, just because Atlanta doesn't want to show its reality and, um, and it's, and, but it doesn't go, it hasn't gone away. Like, like you have discussed already. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I definitely like wish I could have put more stories in. Archives are tricky, right? Um, Atlanta archives are tricky. Uh, Atlanta's public housing was segregated uh, well past the 1962 like, desegregation orders <laughs> um, into 1968. And there's like no paper trail for like the desegregation process. It's kind of like there were separate application offices for blacks and whites. Um, and then suddenly there was one application office. Um, and so certainly, it is difficult to piece together like the undercover archive. Um, and so I, I hope to do that in the future by using like different types of sources, but 
you know, I always like, oh, if your, if your dad has papers, please donate them to a library so that like that history can be preserved. Um, and there are certainly like so many efforts, but I, I do thank the city of Atlanta for its amazing histories and archives that have been made available to researchers like me. There's so much more left to tell. There's already a question in the Q&A that I actually think um, you'll have an interesting answer to. Um, Caroline asks, how come our public housing in the US doesn't offer ownership to its residents like public and social housing in other countries? She mentions Singapore as an example. Yeah, so many reasons, but it actually did. Um, there were definitely like pilot programs on um, not so much like direct tenant ownership, um, but uh, certainly like residential management. Um, but the, the problem with generally with all of these sort of different types of experiences, the failure to account for the past. <laughs> and so they were like totally cool with like giving 70 year old women who had not done any sort of like ma property management. <laughs> you know, the, the keys basically in the nineties when these buildings were like 60 years old, like full of like tons of like, you know, like issues with tenants, with children, with uh, workers, with unit condition. And they're like, yeah, you all are the managers now. Now you don't have any real power, but like anytime we need to evict anyone, like that's all you. <laughs> and so like they were giving them like these horrible jobs, but they were excited because they were able to like control the development. So like they could determine who got the maintenance jobs. They could like create a better system within it, but it was like a losing battle. And so like, I totally be down for social housing and tenant ownership and things like that. If the buildings are in good condition, um, I don't want people to get control of crappy buildings that are 80 years old that have asbestos and lead and mold and vermin and are not going to be able to be maintained. Um, we have a huge issue with infrastructure maintenance, whole other talk, I guess, but <laughs> certainly the, the idea that um, autonomy and, and community control and local control are wonderful options, um, but we have a huge issue <laughs> with racism in this country around social welfare programs and welfare in general, and so um, that would be another barrier to sort of overcome, but it is a good question. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, as your book points out, home ownership was the initial goal for the public housing program, right? Uh, yeah. Not so successful. Um, I mean, it was it was mainly successful because of the mortgage industry and basically a lot of racism only for white residents. Yeah. And, you know, it worked a little bit for like I have um, University Homes, another great archive find kind of tracked all of their residents. Um, over like 40 years and left these little cute cards about where they moved and everything like that. And like, because of the, the screening procedures of the 1930s, there were some pretty affluent, you know, black families living. Some that were like kind of kicked out because they were over income, but there was really no place for them to go. So like once the private market did open up just a little bit, there's like, a quarter of public housing like pieces out for the private market. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly like racism, hard stop keeps you out of the, the home ownership game. Um, and then by the 60s, it's, it's totally done. Um, so the mobility is gone, but it, you know, I found that actually like the most active tenants, particularly in the years that King is talking about, like in the late, like 2006, 2010, most of them had left public housing and owned homes and came back. So they were like, eh. <laughs> you know, they were like, this is like fine, it's great, but there's no community. Like, you know, Dentra said, there's no community. Um, home ownership is a pain, right? Like hot water heaters, property taxes, like long commutes, like who paved driveways, what? Like, it's, you know, it never ends. <laughs> and so that was not necessarily going to work for people who have this kind of like precarious hold on the labor market too, right? Um, so this is like, if you want this like working class city or like a city with like a, a service class, right? you wanna have like nice restaurants and mani petties, those people have to live somewhere. And like now like Atlanta housing is on that. 
uh, no longer Atlanta Housing Authority, Atlanta Housing, <laughs> but they are on it, right? Like this is how they're actually like pushing public housing now. It's like, look, you need to partner with us. If you want to like bring in like everyone into the city and have it all luxury, like someone has to provide that luxury <laughs> at a good cost. And like, we need to house those people that are doing those services. And so, you know, that could be another act of paternalism. I don't know, like, like, how you think of that framing, but it is, um, it is certainly a new framing and a more affirming one than what they had before. <laughs> um, another theme that comes up over and over again over the decades that you cover in your book, and that I think is still very relevant today, so I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts about it, is um, how um, uh, a lot of these programs set out to help a low-income community, but then ended up filtering out what they considered the best of the residents. Um, and um, yeah, I'm wondering how, if you think this idea of the deserving poor, if that evolved over time or how that changed. And then I would also love to hear King and Nedra's thoughts on how that plays out in development today. Yeah, certainly the deserving poor is, is, a, is the flip side to deviance. So if we're going to like keep creating these different categories over time, you can certainly see it becoming from like black entirely to working class to you know non-working to contact with the carceral state and so on and so forth. Now people experiencing homelessness. And so certainly I think there are categories within categories. We no longer have affordable housing, we have workforce housing. So same two sides of the same coin, I think. Did, did tenants associations, do they help push up, push back against um, those standards and open it up or did that change over time? It gets a little complicated as like the over time. Um, certainly, you know, I see um, like with um, the earlier question about ownership, once those residents became uh, managers, they really took on um, a lot of the managers kind of issues and gripes, right? So they were complaining about tenants with late rent. Um, they were, you know, complaining about drug use and a lot of like too many strangers hanging around. And so I, I definitely think that um, spaces were made based, like you said, on their own experiences. So they were certainly you know, worried about the safety of elderly versus, you know, the um, recreation and employment opportunities for youth, right? Because those youth are kind of scary to them. And so there was definitely, you know, those sort of tensions within the, the, the tensions uh, over time. Nedra, do you think that today um, we are still picking and choosing who is allowed to be included in, you know, the development process, the political structure? Um, I will say I think that is the case in a sense um, that in, I will say, like in public meetings, right? And in, <laughs> there's a lot of community engagement happening. You go to a meeting and it's asking you where should this trail go or where, you know, what should this sidewalk look like? Um, there's always technical language, technical imagery, technical, or the people who are in it aren't reflective of those who are in the neighborhood. There's so many levels that keep people from going to um, those outreach moments where they could say give a voice or opinion. They may not feel like they're qualified. Um, that's like one caveat to who's not participating and maybe some reasons why. Um, but uh, and I will also just want to point back to something you said earlier, Akira, around like um, the siting of Black neighborhoods, you know, Black projects as well as Black subdivisions in the suburbs are cited in the same way. So it's, there is no access to um, public spaces, you know, be it recreation, be it the grocery store, be it um, schools, it's a, it's a far commute. So that isolation, iso people, yeah, of course, if you're used to living close in close proximity to people and that network, um, being away from that is uncomfortable. And, but I think that's, you know, that goes back to that community engagement too. Like, I think it's all, it's all connected to each other. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think that, um, 
the the issue with the, the distance is another complexity because of women with children um, like school age children and the issues of you know performing care and keeping you know siblings in the same school and being able to like walk and it is overwhelming I think um, these sort of um, calculations that women particularly nowadays are having to make um, to navigate the housing market and the and the loss of public housing you know women that I've talked to have they kind of experience um, homelessness as part of their housing search, um, which I, I don't know, I, that leaves me speechless, which is rare. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, I understand that public housing was not great and the condition was bad, but I cannot imagine having to absorb that experience as part of, you know, like this is part of, housing this is what the housing market is and I think it's kind of common like I wouldn't just say just swing with children I think it's a fair number of Atlantans that experience that um yeah I think King I was going to um ask you about the you've done a lot of work looking at the the, the demolitions of these projects and I think that's where we especially look at who gets to stay um who is who uh gets pushed out because of past criminal records or, um, uh, I don't know, some, as you point out in your book, Akira, addictions suddenly start happening <laughs> near the end of these projects. Um, King, what did you find in your research about what qualified people to be allowed into these more exclusive mixed income developments? Um, first, uh, I want to go, I wanted to actually answer the question you asked earlier, um, and I want to get, just make sure I had it, but I'll answer this one first. Uh, what I saw was this notion of the deserving poor, kind of what Akira was talking about, continue to play out, um, especially towards the end of public housing. It became a lot more of tenants complaining about, you know, small infractions, um, especially against their children, especially amongst like if they had a nephew or a son mm. um, that was often getting them kicked out and had this, this circular effect where, you know, if the son got in a fight at school, that particular fight would then be used against the mother to get them removed from housing. That was something that happened a lot in Bankhead courts the last few years that it was open. Um, and then also something that happened a lot was this notion of, especially in the last year, they just stopped allowing people to come in to public housing. So like a lot of the roles, they just kind of let it go on. And it was a general purge. And so a lot of people were just afraid of general purge. And so if a woman had, case in point, this is one of the things we saw a lot in the last days where a woman might have a domestic dispute where she's in good reason to call the police. But because she calls the police, at that point in time now, she's also kicked out of public housing because now she had a domestic abuse or she had a man who shouldn't have been there after hours. And so it just became like this evergreen problem for no real reason. And so it kept a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't have been going on. And it was really, really, it was really unfortunate because you can just tell at that point in time that the outgoing administration um, was definitely intent on getting people removed as, as quickly as possible to get that development going. And I think it's ironic that um, all that didn't lead to the economic development they thought. Um, most of those sites have sat now vacant for a decade. And mm -hmm. it's only now that they're really, a whole decade later that they're really starting to get some traction or some speculation. Yeah. There are two really good questions in the chat. Can I? <laughs> Them? Okay, excellent. Um, <laughs> we'll start with this one. Um, Miss Ma uh, James says, uh, Miss Matthews was also a leader in welfare rights org and a leader um, in a kind of united poor people's coalition that disappeared as people were driven out of public housing. The question is how to restructure those groups. And I think that's, um, yeah, that's a huge question that your book leaves open. So <laughs> I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts about that. <laughs> Yeah, I frequently, like every talk I give, I talk about this is all because we lost ACORN. Uh, we have no national structure to support our regional, state, and local structures. And um, mobilization is only as good as the volunteers that have the strength for it. And so once they burn out, um, all of that institutional memory is lost. So that's really what I hope this book captures is that there have been so many precedents for successful tenant organizing and capacity building that like, I don't want that to get lost um, in this new era of housing for sure.
Uh, can I add one thing to that question, if you don't mind, Stephanie? Uh, which is, I think we're going to start seeing that come around again. Um, this is more, it is a kind of a national trend that's also reflective in Atlanta. I think we are starting to see like Housing Justice League and just a lot of like the students I see from like Georgia State and what happened a few years back uh, with the, the tent city. Um, I think we're getting a new version of that kind of activism. I think it's going to be a little different in the sense it's probably going to be more decentralized and it's going to be more sporadic. Um, but in terms of addressing it, I think the future is these groups are probably more likely than not going to be sporadic and also very, very like hyper focused because we don't have public housing anymore. So it's likely going to be, you know, whatever the housing justice league equivalent is going to be in Smyrna or mm -hmm. in as far as Gainesville. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that versus like a big tent organization. And it's going to be about maybe housing for seniors or housing for families or housing for women with children. So I think that's going to be the restructuring and that would probably be what the focus is going to go. And that, okay, sorry. No, I just think that's like, I think that's amazing, right? Like, I think it was probably um, wrong headed at the time for public housing to be developed strictly for nuclear families. Um, that that is not necessarily a sustainable category over time. And also that that may not be the best way to gain mobility. Um, and so as much as we can do for like when with like special categories like that, but also kind of like more fluid ones, you know, like there's never like any housing for single men, which like I don't want to like hop on this soapbox, but it's certainly like you have like all of these like categories of people of need that just go totally under the radar and um, it would be like an easy fix and so and not like a tiny home, but like a sustainable program. Um, and so certainly, yeah, I, I do agree that I do think it'll, I hope that it'll change and shift and become much more dynamic instead of kind of a one size fits all. I, you know, we need different, like the first question, we need different time, types of housing. Apartments don't work for everyone. So you need some social housing, you need some land trust, you need like multiple forms. Sorry, I'm trying to mean to cut you off. Not at all. You had a, that's a great, those are great solutions and ideas. And I, I really just wanted to add the idea. Um, a museum studies person, he said that remembering is a radical act. And the fact that we don't have these narratives really readily available, we don't have anything to go back to or to remember or to even model. Um, and just to touch back to what King said around networks, it's like we've just had mutual aid out the wazoo from last summer. And so like having networks come together and alive again and come together, um, people are communicating. So being able to design housing to think differently, we have, we have more opportunity and imagery available that is necessary. And, and you know, the other thing about your book that I really like is that it sparked my imagination around housing, around political activism, around what a leader looks like, um, because we do, you know, we look at leadership, it still is someone who is charismatic. And that's not necessarily what leadership is. There's just like one type of leadership. Right, right. I think um, Akira's book also shows these, how these physical spaces become places where this tenant organizing can happen. And Edra, I'm curious about what you think about that um, now, like what spaces could serve that role today? Yeah, um, um, I will say, so over two years ago now, I was doing the summer, there were some students who were part of um, a tenants, like a young person's tenant, tenants rights activism group, mm -hmm. uh, part of Housing Justice League. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that apartment complex is now torn down, Forest Cove. So, and those students were looking at their apartment complex and they, they came on a tour with me through the Beltline, uh, Old Fourth Ward to look at that Beltline community and what development did for their community and how they could prepare their community um, for the Beltline coming through their neighborhood. And so um, being able to um, have access, you know, realizing you have agency, having like your book also provides language that is around justice, that's reparative, that is uplifting of the lived experience of poor black people that doesn't always happen. So to be able to, to be empowered in that way, I think it does create spaces, you know, it allows for people to not feel the sense of shame 
which, you know, like, again, my dad said, I didn't grow up in public housing, but you did. <laughs> so many people did. It's fine. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, you don't have to be in denial of that experience. And so, um, so I think those spaces are, uh, you know, back to King's point, it's in so many ways, because it's digital, it's uh, new networks, you know, coming together to put hands together to work, are just um, some ways that that is forming. So uh, I think language provides a, a, a space that is necessary. We have the big question from Michael Leo Owens of Emory University. <laughs> he says, for the entire panel, thinking about the Atlanta case in the book's arguments, how should we judge the city's modern history of Black political leadership, especially in relation to public housing and poor Black people? Who would like to start? <laughs> Why is he asking this question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lila, for such an interesting question. Um, I think we could, um, I, you know, we judge the history, um, it's kind of a work in progress. Um, I think the people who kind of live in public housing should be the ones you judge. Um, but I will say that certainly, you know, the archives are really deep. And I, I kind of want to bring up King's point about the, the empty land because they knew that was going to happen. Um, Atlanta Housing did, and they actually didn't want that to happen. Um, there are plenty of um, first round applications for Perry Homes, for example, which I imagine is one of the vacant areas um, that says like, there is no way we can do market rate housing here. So we need to like, if you don't want to replace all 1000 units, then how about we, we just build 600 um, and, and that's it, just rebuild it. Um, and the regional HUD office was like, absolutely not. Like, we're not doing that anymore. We're off that. <laughs> so like find some, you know, like they had the, the planners did the site and the market analysis. And it's like, there's no way these census tracts can support you know, market rate housing, a grocery store, any of these things. And regional HUD said no. And so Atlanta Housing had to rewrite their um, application or they weren't going to get any money. And so eventually it was like 400 and 300, 200. And now, you know, it's something that's like they redeveloped it, but it's not there, right? It's like the household income is not there. They are going to do some speculative development of townhomes for, you know, half a million to see how it works, but it's not, the market isn't there. Um, and it's, um, yeah, so I don't, you know, it, it's hard be, with the leadership because you can only do so much in the city. <laughs> um, it's a city for growth. Um, it's a city for business and it's a city for just you know, money. And so it is very hard to sustain this like robust impoverished population and like a robust policy imperative around that impoverished population. Um, and so that to me is um, both part of the structure um, and obviously there's some agency of the individual politicians um, involved, but I think overall for black leadership um, given how dependent they are financially on developers and other sort of um, business interests, it is very hard to have a Black radical um, policy agenda that would address the needs of public housing in the ways that it needed to be addressed. Let me get you with that one, Milo. <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to add one thing. One, Milo, you always ask good questions, so shout out to you. Um, so I want to, your question is kind of like a little bit complicated, so I want to break down a few parts of it. Uh, one of which is how should we judge the city's history of Black political leadership, especially in relation to Black public housing and poor Black people? Uh, one, I think we should grade all Black political leadership on what they do with what they have at the time. Um, one of the things I think is very important for Atlanta, both inside and outside, we look to Atlanta as effectively not just a Mecca, but we look to every Black leader as the savior of Black people or the, the representation of what saviorship could look like. I think that's very dangerous, right? Uh, we can go off on the whole tangent on that, but I think that's important to, to, to specify when we talk about Black political leadership. Um, and I, we have to also be contextual in the sense that the only reason we have Black political leadership now for almost 50 years 
Um, and its threats to black polit political leadership has been the result of white flight and what that's done to the city. And so with that white flight, um, it also effectively handicapped most of our black political leaders, especially Maynard Jackson, who, which gets into the, the actual meat of your question, Milo. Um, in terms of public housing, you can make an argument that maybe Maynard Jackson was the most forward. And what I mean by forward is in terms of his social positions, his public positions on public housing, him sleeping at Bowen Homes, for example, um, and him being for poor people and trying to include more marginalized people in his administration, having more uh, jobs available. But afterwards, you can maybe say that every mayor going forward who has been Black has realized that maybe the only way, their idea of, of helping poor people is Black economics um, and Black economic empowerment. And that's a completely different system. Um, so I would say on an actual grade, because that's probably what you want to have an answer to, I think most Black mayors in Atlanta are about a C when it comes to addressing the needs of public housing and poor Black people. Um, but they it's not necessarily always malicious, but it, sometimes it's just a reflection of the time that they're in and they're, um, and what they're doing with what they have. So that's a long-winded answer. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I hit all of your, your questions on that one. That's, and I'll take a very small sliver of that question. And um, to me, it looks like some of the actions that were taken up in this book by the women actors, you know, it's like that black radical feminism, um, you know, building coalitions and upticking and, and communication, sharing of information, being able to go to meetings um, and then also supporting, you know, like folks who aren't poor need to be about the causes of poor people. So is that alliance? Um, and just really remember that in, we're all in the same fabric, you know, one of us without the other, we don't really move forward. And so, and, and like take that to heart. Uh, we say that we are the city built on Dr. King's legacy. So we really have to live towards these ideals and not make them just ideals, but actually a part of our lived experiences and how we continue to act um, in community um, neighborly towards each other. And sometimes it really does just begin with like saying hello to the person you're seeing on the street. And it does, that just doesn't happen in Atlanta anymore. People do not speak and say hello. So. <laughs> no way, um, I can't believe that. <laughs> maybe once the masks come off. Well, come back Akira, we'll say hello to you, we promise. Hello. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, take us on a trip to the archives, field trip, please. You have to go. I mean, the the um, I don't know how it's going now, but certainly the archivist there always kind of holds these public shows and really wants to get the stuff out there. But there's so much, there's so much. Please, they're all over AUC, Auburn Avenue Research Library, Atlanta History Center, like everywhere you go in the city. Emory, Rose Library, everyone, just amazing. That's what I was going to ask you. Sorry, Stephanie. Oh, you should go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, about the, about the archives, which one you went to. I know, like, I've tried to look at Atlanta Housing um, Archives online, which it's it's more of they sit, they copy and send to you. So I was just wondering, like, how how did you find all of the photos that you were able, but you just kind of went through the whole collection of, of archives in the city? Yeah. I, I, I went through a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was eight years. So it was a long it was a long time but yeah I went and I like I said I didn't even scratch like I didn't get into demolition and like the actual part of it I really had to like pull back like the Olympics was enough to just take me out um so it is so much left to uncover in that city and I, I really hope that people take advantage of it yeah, I hope we can all have a public event together once it's safe to do so and you feel like traveling. <laughs> I got my second shot. Happy. <laughs> well, this has been really fun. I think we're basically out of time. And yeah. I will pass it on to Joe. Thank you. Thank you everyone so much for contributing to this discussion. I always find Atlanta history so fascinating and, and um, you know, Atlanta is going to continue to develop you know, we're going to hear more about attracting businesses and, and you know, um, movie studios and things like that. And I, and I don't think that these discussions are going to stop. Um, but, you know, I would like at least for those involved in them to use a bit of history to give it a little bit of foresight, you know, before we start demolishing and rebuilding the, the way we seem to do things in Atlanta. 
It's like, you know, there's always a wrecking ball somewhere. But once again, thank you, Nedra. Thank you, King. Thank you, Akira, for your wonderful book. And thank you, Stephanie, for being a wonderful moderator this evening and starting us off with some unbelievably thoughtful questions. If you'd like to order a copy of the book, once again, we've put an ordering link for Karis Books and more over in the chat. We will be on again tomorrow night for the Stephanie Abrams event for the Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series. And you can still have time to purchase a few tickets also from Karis Books and more. Thank you all so very much for inviting us into your homes this evening. We will be back and see you again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening.